Good morning, Redeemer. Let's stand to our feet today. This is a new song this morning, but I know it's going to bless you. As we bless the Lord, we'll catch on together. Let's sing it out loud. Blessing, honor, strength, and power. Yours alone now and forever. Love this world could never stop. Soften my heart 
are not easy words if we really mean what we are singing to say to the Lord that I'm asking you to break me is not easy but at the core of the matter when we're going through things in life we can get stuck on what's right in front of us what's right in front of us what's right in front of us and we don't see all the other things that God is doing in our life and it really means that we as believers have to take the time to know who God is. We just sang about it. If we know who God is, if we know that his purposes are to take care of us and not to harm us, then we can trust his hand. But a lot of the time, and myself included, we don't take the time to know who God really is at the core of the matter. And we're so focused on what is ahead of us that we don't think about all the other things that God has for us. This is a funny story, but it's true. One day, Edwin was giving Anna a bath, and I can overhear this. I'm sorry I'm taking the story, because it's so true. We have like a bazillion bottles, that's a technical term, a bazillion bottles lined up of, of shampoo for Anna, and body wash, and all this stuff for Leah, and 
And I got this new one for, for Leah since she has eczema and I didn't want Anna to touch it. And she's like, but I want that one. Mind you, again, the bazillion bottles are here. She can have all of those, but she wants the one that she can't have. And I looked at that and I go, sermon illustration? That's so true, right? That's us. God has given us so much. He's given us I would say most of us say we have food on our, our tables at night. We have shelter over us. We take those two things hugely for granted. We have families, we have friends. God has given us his son that we're gonna celebrate through communion today, but we get stuck on the one thing that we want that God says no to. Believers today, Let's be grateful. Let's be grateful for what God has given us. Let's be grateful for his son, for salvation, for the opportunity to start over each and every moment. If we just come before the Father and confess our sins, what does the scripture tell us? He is righteous and faithful to forgive us. Let's be grateful for what he has done for us. And let's thank him as we sing this morning. Sing this to the Lord. Lift your voices. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the price you pay. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for unending grace. Thank you for your hope. Thank you for this life you give. There is no Thank you for your promise. Thank you for your favor. Thank you for your love and everything you've done for me. There's no
awesome and holy God, there is truly none like you. Lord, you stand alone in righteousness and majesty and splendor. Lord, and even now the angels circle your throne, singing praises to your name. God, I thank you. I thank you. Because in all your holiness, you didn't forget about your people. You never abandon your children. God, a lot of the times it's us that turn our backs on you. So Lord, today I pray that we would turn our faces to you and God, that you would shine down on us and that we would thank you, God, for your redeeming grace for your salvation, for your never ending love for us. God, forgive us when we are so focused on the one thing that we want that you have told us no to. God, help us, help us to see your blessings, help us to see your mercy and to be grateful for Jesus Christ. Forgive us when it becomes numb on us. But would your salvation be alive in us today? Spirit, rain down on us. Move in our hearts. Move in this place. God, the sweet spirit of worship that is here. Would we relinquish our hearts to you? Would we lay down our pride this morning and that whatever you have for us, God, that we would submit to your will, not our own, but to yours, God, and that we would be able to say, we give you all the glory and all the honor. That's the point, that we reflect the one who has given us everything, but we give you all the glory, not just with our mouths on Sunday mornings, but with our lives as we go out of this place. Would we give you all the glory? Would we declare the glory of God? Would we declare the salvation of Jesus Christ? We thank you, God. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen.
have your Bibles, would you turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 24, and I'll meet you there in just a few moments. Uh, we continue working our way through uh, the book of 1 Samuel on our way to Christmas. We are looking at David the king uh, on our way to the true and greater king, Jesus Christ, who will be born, and we will celebrate his birth here in just a few months. But on the way, we begin to see uh, the unfolding of the kingship of Israel and how this all points us towards uh, the true king that is to come. Uh, if, if you continue to turn in your Bibles to first cha chapter 24, 1 Samuel chapter 24, I'll meet you there in a second, as I said. Um, let's, kind of re let's kind of recap very quickly where we've been and where we're going. Um, we started off with Samuel, who is broken because uh, the king of the, t of the moment, Saul, has crashed and burned. Uh, this was the people's choice, not God's choice. The people wanted a king who would go to defend them. Saul really doesn't defend them. The people wanted a king who would take nothing from them. Saul, Saul takes everything from them. And here is Samuel watching this man crash and burn before his eyes. And we began our sermon series talking about how there are moments in our lives that bring us to a halt. We fall into this pit, into this hole, and we are stuck in our mourning. And even though life has kind of moved on and it's been weeks and a couple of months or a couple of years, this hole in our life, this moment, is still determining and dictating direction. And what does God say to Samuel? Fill your horn with oil, get up, and let's move. In other words, God is the one who extends the hand. Christ extends the hand and says, I am here to pull you out of this hole, and you are filling your horn with oil. There is somewhere I am sending you. And he sends him to anoint the young shepherd boy, David. What we said about that moment was very powerful because there's a phrase used for that moment that is not used elsewhere, which is the spirit rushed upon David from that day onward. Everyone else that that phrase is used for, Saul and Samson, at least in the Old Testament at this point, it was just for that day, for that moment. But here is from that day forward, and I made a very big deal to us as a church. I pushed very hard on you to think through my encounter with Christ versus my walk with Christ. A lot of people mistake a moment of emotion, a moment of feeling a little guilty, a little bit ashamed, and, oh, I understand what God has done with me, for me, with actually walking and being transformed into the likeness of Christ. There's a very big difference between having an emotional moment in church or at a conference or during worship and actually walking the road with the Lord, walking the road with Jesus and being changed to look more like Him and less like us. So that's kind of what, that kind of laid the groundwork for everything else. We saw David face Goliath, and we realized that it has nothing to do with Sunday school or children. The, first, the author of 1 Samuel is telling us that this Goliath represents the devil himself. His armor was made out of scales, the author says. The only other animal we've seen with scales up to that point in Scripture is a snake in the garden. And he is saying, this is not some giant man. This is the giant enemy of God's people. And we talked about how when we are in those Samuel moments, those, those broken moments, then here comes the devil and he will slide Goliath right up to the edge of the hole to make it look even bigger and harder to get out so that you will lose hope. What did David say? Who is this Philistine that defies the armies of the living God? In other words, it doesn't matter how deep the hole is, it doesn't matter how big Goliath is, Jesus has won. And we need to begin to live in that fashion. We live so often as Christians in the shadow of Goliath when we should live in the shadow of the victory of the cross. And that was the challenge at that moment. Then we looked at Jonathan and David, this intimate friendship that has been born in the most difficult of moments. And I challenge you as a church to covenant with one another, to love each other powerfully and deeply as David and Jonathan loved themselves. They, they surrendered their lives. They surrendered. They, there was no walls. There were no weapons. There was nothing to be afraid of. It was just friendship. And we ask the question, when you're in trouble or you need advice, do you call someone in your church or do you call someone who's not a believer first? That will tell you who you are covenanting with. Not that there's not good advice outside these walls or outside of Scripture because God teaches and molds everyone, but it should be someone who is walking with the Lord first. And so last week, our youth pastor Ricky took us through this running from Saul, how God provides and equips along the way. And today we're going to come to the tail end of some of that running. And that's where chapter 24 kind of picks up today. We've stopped running for a moment and we're located in this wilderness, which I'll show you on the other side of the scripture reading this morning so that we get a sense of where we are uh, and why God is being described and what, you know, this will all mean to David going forward. But having said that, as a matter of introduction and setting the table, 
1 Samuel chapter 24. Uh, if you want to hold the Bible in your hands, the blue ones in front of you are the ones in English. It will be behind me here in just one second. As we always do in our church, we stand together as a show of respect to God's word. 1 Samuel chapter 24, beginning in verse 1 through 12. This is the word of God. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all of Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of, when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscious stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift up my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, my Lord and the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lift my hand against my master because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. Now understand and recognize that I am not guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. Amen. May the Lord bless his word this morning. Uh, thank you. Please be seated. You'll see here behind me a very basic outline this morning, kind of walking us through this passage. Let's first talk about this hunt continuing. Uh, I have a picture to show you kind of where we are, this desert of, of Gedi, of En Gedi it's called. It'll be here behind me in just a moment. I want you to get a sense of the terrain and what this looks like. And then, see, this is the desert. This is where this is taking place, some of the hunting and pursuing. And then when David, with this mountain that I refer to that is kind of between Saul and David, looks a little bit like this. We'll show you the next picture here. This is kind of where we are. That's the size of these things. They're not the Rockies. It's not like the Carolina mountains with beautiful little green pine trees. This is rough and arid, and they're, they're chasing each other. And Saul is pursuing David through this kind of terrain. If you want, leave that up for a second. Uh, you can leave that picture up for a second. We'll kind of walk through that. So here's, here's what I want us to see today. We've been running and running and running through the wilderness, and now Saul is on one side of a massive mountain that you saw, this kind of rock structure, and David is on the other, and Saul is continuing his pursuit. And we need to just pause for a moment to notice that there is this massive rock, this massive mountain in between Saul and David. And you're saying to yourself, okay, so what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is this. We begin to see some of the themes begin to emerge from 1 Samuel. And actually, we'll pick, well, I'll read you two ver one verse from 1 Samuel at the beginning, and then how 2 Samuel ends. Listen to these words and tell me if this doesn't sound familiar. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. God is always referred to as a rock. Now, look at how 2 Samuel ends. You can hear David, his voice kind of coming through a little bit. Listen. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. From violent people, you save me. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise and has been saved from my enemies. The waves of death swirled about me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. Ten years of running, church. Ten years of running from Saul. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I called out to my God. From his temple, he heard my voice, and a cry came to his ears. As David reflects on his running, as he reflects on this madman who has been after him now for over ten years, he is running. Can you imagine running for ten years? Every now and then on the news, you see, this person was caught from 23 years ago. They committed a crime, and you think to yourself, how awful to live in that fashion. Looking your show, or looking over your shoulder every single day to see if they're, if they're still pursuing you. Someone's going to come up and grab you. And this is what's happening in this kind of terrain for over 10 years, in and out of Israel, in and out of towns and villages. And, there, and, and the one major truth 
that David finds through this running through the wilderness, this picture you're seeing here behind me is this. All throughout, the Lord has been his rock, this unmovable, this unshakable individual and character that I could always turn to no matter what. And now we begin to see this beautiful theme emerge from the book of Samuel, which is this. We talked about this last year, but I'll just refresh your memory. When Hannah, who gives birth to Samuel, was still barren, they go, they go to Shiloh to offer some sacrifices. And I don't know if you remember, but I kind of preached that sermon, and maybe you just remember from your readings of Scripture. She's standing at the door of the temple, well, at the door of the sanctuary. The temple's not here yet, just the sanctuary where they worship and offer sacrifices. And Eli, the priest, is sitting nearby. And Hannah's at the door, and she's in this kind of prayer moment, this kind of spirit moment, and she's weeping and crying. And it's so intense that he thinks that she's drunk. It's like, why do you come to church drunk that way? She says, no, 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 no. It's just that my spirit is grieved. And we said that day how it's not until Hannah figured out that it was not a child she needed. It was God that she needed. That her prayers weren't answered. That the doors are not open for that. But then what we find in that moment is that Eli stands between Hannah and her pain. Hannah and her barrenness. He is the one that stands in the gap for her. And then as we continue to unpack for Samuel, we realize that Samuel stands in the gap for Israel. He becomes that voice. He becomes that rock for them. And then these last few weeks, we talked about Jonathan and David, how Jonathan is that rock for David. He is protecting him from his own father who was trying to kill David. Jonathan is that rock. And what you begin to see is that all throughout 1 Samuel, God has been this unmovable, unshakable rock that people can lean and depend on the whole way through. And so church, this morning I say this to you, allow God to be your rock. Stop trying to be the rock yourself. We waste so much time trying to be that unmovable and unshakable. Allow God to be the one who stands between you and your pain, between you and your anxiety. Allow God to be the one who stands between you and the problem in your family, the problem at work, between you and your worries. Allow God to be that rock, church. Allow him to be that for you. Allow him to be the refuge and the stronghold, church. Allow him to be the one who stands in the gap for you. God sent his son to be the rock in between you and sin, between you and death, between you and the devil. Christ is our rock. Christ is our refuge. Christ is our stronghold in times of trouble. Not your husband, not your wife, not your job, not your bank account. Not what you know or what you think you know. Not that book you're going to read. Christ is your rock. Allow him to be your refuge. Allow him to be who, the person who stands in the gap between you and whatever you might be facing. Our second point, when they are vulnerable. Thank you. You can switch over. Thanks so much. When they're vulnerable. What were the chances that the one cave that Saul picked to relieve himself? And by the way, we are talking about bathroom here, okay? For those of you who are wondering, what exactly is the Bible saying? It's not one of those seminary tricks. He just went to the bathroom. Okay? Uh, number one, number two. Okay, that's what we're talking about. So, and then, you know, all the, all the skeptics and the, you know, the university professors, yes, but where's the toilet paper? That's not the issue. Okay? The issue is this. The issue is that this man walks into the cave, and we're going to unpack this a little bit more, but he is vulnerable. That's all the scripture is trying to tell you here. He walks in, and in order to relieve himself, guess what he has to do? He has to strip himself down to nothing. The tunic has to come off. The armor has to come off. The sword has to be put aside. The, the bow and arrow is put aside. The belt that holds it all together with the dagger in the back, the last line of protection, it's all aside. This man is vulnerable. And we'll, we're going to get to that in a second. We'll talk about it in a second because there's some stuff that we've got to unpack before that. Here is David. And he is in the wilderness running from Saul, but that does not keep him from being tested by God. Because the test is this, will you rely on me to give you the throne or will you take it? Israel, will you rely on me through the wilderness or will you rely on yourself? Christ in the wilderness being tempted, will you rely on God's word, on your father's word or will you rely on yourself, Jesus Christ, when the devil is tempting you? Here we are again in the wilderness. Now church, let's say something about the wilderness. The wilderness is the place where God loves to reshape and redirect his people. And the wilderness is not pleasant. But if you find yourself in the wilderness today, if you're sitting here today listening to the, the sound of my voice, and you're saying to yourself, I am in a wilderness, I am in a dry, arid place, 
and I'm not sure what's going on, but God is doing something major in me because all of a sudden, my support systems and everything that was comfortable to me and all my customs and habits, they're behind me. And I find myself kind of in that desert place. If you're there, don't fight it. Embrace it. Because that's where God takes everyone that he wants to redirect and reshape. And that just means that he's preparing you for that new place to go. But you can't go to that new place because you're not ready for it yet. And you have to go through the wilderness first. It's got to be alone. You've got to go to a deeper depth of obedience, a deeper depth of listening, a deeper depth of following. And so David finds himself in the wilderness not only being pursued but being changed, being changed by his God. And now he is also representing to us here once again this new Adam because he has a destiny-altering choice before him. I was anointed king. I have every right to walk up behind this man and slaughter him right here and right now. The throne is mine. What will you do, David? Will you just take the throne the easy way? You've heard this before. Adam and Eve, did God really say you must not eat from the tree? Isn't there a throne for you here somewhere? What did the devil say to Jesus? If you really are the son of God, stones to bread. Jump from the top of the church. If you really are. David, did you hear the men? Do you hear the whispers now? It all starts sounding familiar. This is the day that God said he would send. He would turn him into your hand. Kill him now. He's tried to hurt you, throwing spears at you while you played the harp for him. He's hunting you. He's trying to keep you from your God-ordained path. He rejected his own son, Jonathan, because you guys are best friend. He deserves death. He needs to be out of your way. This is your chance. He's vulnerable. He is naked before you, David. Come up from the dark shadows of the cave and just eliminate your threat. Forget about the wilderness. Let's fast forward through the wilderness and let's grab the throne. Do you hear it? Do you hear the temptation in your own life? Don't suffer through it. Don't wait on God. Take it. Go for it. Skip the suffering. Skip the hard parts. There was this old guy in church. I didn't like him very much. Um, because here's what he did to me every single Sunday. Every single Sunday in the church I grew up in, there was an older guy, and he would put a quarter in his hand. And every single Sunday he would tell me, if you take the quarter, it's yours. Take it from my hand. So as a little kid, you know, you can't sit there and say, oh, this is easy. And when you, he pulls it away. Well, what's wrong? Can't you get the quarter? He pulls it away. And so after like 10 times, I just gave up and went to ask Grandpa for a dollar and went to go buy the fries across the street. Okay, I gave up on the quarter. But he did it to me every single Sunday. So there was this sense where I want to snatch and grab it just to have it because I kind of think I need it. And you know what, church, as I thought about David and Saul in the cave, here is the temptation to snatch and grab to snatch and grab. We treat God's hands that way. We think he's going to pull the blessing away. Church, we serve and we love and we worship a good God who does not pull his hand away from his children. Old guys in churches annoy little kids that way, yes? But God does not. Okay? I'm a little scarred from that experience. I'm just sharing that with you. Um, Sometimes, when you look at God's hands, let's connect to wilderness. When you look at God's hands, and he seems to be offering you nothing, it's because you're not ready yet. Because it's not time. It's not that he's not giving you anything. He's giving you everything. Just look around. Take a quick look and you see it. But when you look and say, wow, why, why is God not providing for me? Why is he not giving me this? Because you're not ready. But God never pulls his hands away from his children. David was conscious stricken. He was broken. You saw that. He starts yelling at his men. And he shouldn't have done that because he himself realized, oh, if God is my rock and my refuge and my stronghold and he's protected me for all of these years, how dare I? 
grab and snatch at the throne. I will wait for God to provide. Church, wait on the Lord. Part of the journey through the wilderness, part of the reshaping of our character is learning to wait and rest on God to provide. If you and me would sit down one-on-one -on -one for two minutes, all of you, and I would ask you a very simple question, tell me when you got yourself in a whole lot of trouble, you would always say it was when I was snatching and grabbing. When I was trying to do it myself. When I thought I would just take it and go. Church, pastor, let's wait on the Lord. That is one of the key, if not the foundational learning of the wilderness. I'll say one thing that kind of leads to our close, which is this. There is this picture of grace that will start small and then we'll go big here. And I guess we're living in a time where, and I guess you could always say it's always been this way, but I guess with media and so many avenues of communication, we communicate less than ever. But nonetheless, there's so much hurt and misunderstanding. And some of it's on purpose and some of it's a misunderstanding, et cetera, et cetera. We can fill in the blanks. But what I want to challenge you with, if the, the trusting and waiting and the not snatching and grabbing is God in us, then the, the flip side of this coin of David's action with Saul is this. Spare the one who has hurt you. Spare them. I know that all of us in this room, we could all march up here and you can share horror stories about what X or Y individual has done to you. And you know what? We would nod our head in agreement. And then I would stand up and I would say, spare their life in the same way that David spared Saul's, in the same way that you and I have been spared. And now we come back to that picture. I want to share it with you very quickly because it's right before us today. We talked about how Saul was vulnerable in that cave. No defense, no way of responding to an attack. He was naked, naked. And there was a mini little army hiding in the back of the cave, ready to take his life if not for the king who stops it. And in the same way that I say to you, spare the one who has hurt you. Forgive them. It's because today the table is before us. And I want you to see this firsthand. God has spared you. God has spared you. You were naked and transparent before him. You had no defense whatsoever. You've been forgiven. You've been forgiven. In the Old Testament, the cup did not represent the new blood in my covenant or the forgiveness of sins, as I'll say to you in just a few moments. This was the cup of God's wrath and judgment been transformed and changed into forgiveness of sin. The destruction that you deserve, that we all deserve because of Adam, because we are his children. Christ was broken so that you would not be broken. We have been spared, brothers and sisters. We were defenseless. We had no argument. We had no way of fixing it. And God decided spare us. He decided to let us walk away unscathed. But there was a price to pay. In the same way that the robe was torn, the son was, in essence, because God never is separated, torn away from his father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Remember those words? We say them every Easter. Why have you forsaken me? Because for a split second he was torn from the Father and all sin and all judgment and all wrath fell on him so it would not fall on us. We've been spared.
brothers and sisters. That's why this is a celebration. I never liked the church I grew up in when they did communion Sunday. Everybody dressed in black. It's not a funeral. It's a celebration of forgiveness and grace that you will never find anywhere else on this planet or in this re reality, but you find it here. Brothers and sisters, we've been spared. We have been spared. And then just to take it a little deeper, and we'll close with this point is this. There is a sense where David walks out of this cave and Saul is now walking down the hill. And when he calls out to him, shows him the peace of the robe, he's giving Saul a chance to reconsider. He's giving him a chance to change his way. I, I had you. The Lord delivered you into my hand. I could have taken your life today. The chance to reconsider, brothers and sisters. I've been in church long enough to know that not everyone who walks in through these doors truly knows Jesus Christ. And it's a good thing to walk in through those doors if you don't know Jesus Christ. Because this is the one place you can find him. But today, as we approach the table, it's the opportunity to reconsider. There is a gap, there is a moment now to reconsider and to say, you know what? Have I, was it just a moment that I had and not really a walk? Was it just a rush of the spirit for a second, but not every single day passed? Am I still in this hole in the ground, dictating direction? Am I still being governed by the Goliaths in my life? Am I alone and isolated? I don't have covenant with my brothers and sisters. And worse, am I in the wilderness? And I don't realize that the rock is right before me. Today is a day to reconsider. And the beauty is that the table gives us a chance to reconsider. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. And I wasn't going to do this today. And it's just going to be for a split moment as we head to the table. But with heads bowed and eyes closed, just this moment, just this moment, it's just a moment between you and the Lord. No one's being called up front today. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Don't worry about the band. They know what they're doing. Their eyes are closed and their heads are bowed too. You need to reconsider. If today you say to yourself, you know, I'm in the wilderness I thought I was walking with the Lord. I thought I was hearing a voice, but I'm not. It was my voice all along. And I need to begin to hear his voice. Maybe for the first time, maybe again. Maybe again. If you need to just, just admit that to the Lord, just in this quiet moment, just, just raise your hand. Just you and the Lord. Not your pastor. Amen. Reconsider. Reconsider, amen. We'll reconsider in the back. Amen. You and the Lord now. You and the Lord. Amen. Let me just pray over those individuals. Father, we thank you for these hands that have gone up around the room. Individuals who are pausing to reconsider, to reconnect, Father, with you. Lord, they thought they knew you, but they didn't. They thought they understood, Father, but they didn't. And Father, now they're beginning to realize that you are our great rock, that fortress, our stronghold in times of trouble, that you have spared us. You have offered us salvation. You have offered us forgiveness. And Father, I pray that as they approach the table this morning and as they take of the cup and as they take of the bread that their soul will not only be refreshed but that they would have that Holy Spirit rushing upon moment from this day forward that King David had. I pray God that if it's in your will this would be the end of their wilderness journey Father. But Lord if there's more to teach and if there's more of you to rely on, Father, then may the journey through the wilderness continue, Father. As they keep their eyes 
on the rock before them. Their great loving father who sent his son to be the rock to stand between us and sin and us and death. Thank you, Father, for sending your son. Thank you that he restored us and rescued us when no one could. He lived the perfect life that we can never live. He died the perfect death that we can never die in order to restore us. by works so that no one can boast. Father, we thank you. Prepare our hearts now as we approach your table this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This table is not the table of Redeemer Church nor of Palmetto Church. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he invites all those who have confessed with their lips and in their hearts that he is their Lord and Savior to come and fellowship with him. As we always do, before we approach the table, we repeat the words of the Apostles' Creed, which is the oldest of our creeds, a summary of the Christian faith. Let's join our voices together. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. As we always do as well, I want to give you a few quiet moments to confess uh, before the Lord. Uh, it's very important that we come to the table uh, just open and transparent before God. So I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads for a moment. Uh, the band will softly play over us, and then I'll close us with a word of prayer. But take this moment to bring your burdens, sins, and mistakes before the Lord and to put it at his feet this morning. Let's come before the Lord in an attitude of confession.
Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves in your presence, knowing that of our own accord we don't deserve to be here. We have inherited the sin of Adam. We are broken vessels, worthy of being ignored, pushed aside, and destroyed fall very short of your holiness. We all fall very short of your law. But Heavenly Father, today we celebrate the fact that you sent your Son to stand in that gap for us. You did not abandon us. You did not forsake us. You did not turn away from us. But instead, Father, you gave us the second person of the Trinity, your Son taking on flesh to redeem all that had been lost and broken. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your Son. Thank you that in him we have forgiveness, true forgiveness, Father. So I pray, God, that this morning, no matter what it is, no matter what's been done, that we would know, that we would experience, that we would be confident in the fact that forgiveness has come in your Son. Your grace has fallen over us. Father, we're being made new into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, today we ask for you to have mercy over us. Wash us clean that we might be whiter than snow. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice, David wrote. Restore me. Restore us, Father. We celebrate today. We celebrate your victory over death. We celebrate your victory over sin. We celebrate your victory over the devil. I pray that chains would fall off of us today, that strongholds would be destroyed. We walk ever closer to you, ever with you, toward you, Father. Make us more like Jesus. And thank you that in him we can approach your table in confidence and boldly have forgiven us for our sin before you. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the great forgiveness we have in Christ. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul writes, I pass on that which I received, that on the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took the bread having blessed it, he broke it. He shared it with his disciples saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and having blessed it, he shared it with his disciples saying, this cup is the new covenant and my blood spilled for many for the remissions of their sins. Do this in remembrance of me. That every time you drink the cup and you break the bread, the Lord's death, you do proclaim until he returns. I would like to ask our leaders to please come forward. They will be taking the elements to you. We will first uh, take of the common loaf and we'll ask you to just hold it for a moment and we will take it together uh, after they return uh, to the front. So, and I will pray for us to kind of close that moment.
is no one like you. There is no one like you, God. Oh, my hope is in you, Jesus. Christ broken for you. Let us eat of it together. Heavenly Father, thank you for breaking your son that we would be made whole. Thank you that he suffered that we might enjoy true joy and true satisfaction. Thank you, Lord, for the cross of your son, Jesus. Prepare our hearts now to take of your cup.
us bow our heads for a moment of prayer and we'll close together in repeating the Lord's Prayer. Heavenly Father, what a gift we have in your Son, Jesus Christ. What a blessing to be able to approach your table, step into your presence, and know that we are welcome because we are your children. You have adopted us as your sons and daughters into your family, Father, a family that cannot be broken or torn apart by anything or anyone. You have made us whole. You have made us new. I pray, Father, that we would find that deeper obedience, that deeper trust, that deeper sense of waiting, Father, for you to work in our lives. I pray that we would cling tightly to Jesus Christ, that we would allow him to lead, Father, allow him to walk before us. I pray that these simple elements would today refresh our souls, that we would not walk out these doors the same people we walked in because we have been in your presence. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your radical providing of redemption for us and sacrificing your son. And we celebrate, Lord, we celebrate him today. Thank you, Lord. strength to overcome. It all comes from you, Father. We're here, Lord, for you today. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he was born on this earth and he walked the road that we walked, suffered what we suffered, Father, so that he would understand us completely. We thank you for all he but especially when he taught his disciples to pray, saying, If you're visiting with us today, we're glad that you're here. We hope that you have been blessed by your time here in our family of faith. If you could just take a moment to fill out the communication cards that should be in front of you. If, there's, if they've run out in the pew in front of you, there are some out in the lobby. If you can just drop those into the clear box on the table outside, we would love to stay in touch with you. We send out a weekly newsletter that kind of brings you up to speed on everything happening with our church. As we always say, God has given us generously and radically with you respond the same way. Having said that, Raul and Danny will collect our morning offering.
for us this morning. Uh, I forgot that was my job this Sunday. Uh, the first of which, <laughs> I was looking at Tara and she's looking at me like, are you going to get up now? Uh, the first of which is our counterculture series, uh, which is uh, continuing on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Again, free dinner at 7 and then worship and the Bible study um, happens here in the church all together. Um, and then we'll be continuing that with an Advent series, I believe, um, continuing on Wednesday night. So we invite you uh, if you any way can uh, work out your schedule during the week to be here on Wednesdays, it's a really uh, great thing to come together during the week and a great refresher for us. Um, big outreach of our church that we've been announcing, and hopefully it's not just kind of coming in one year and out the other, but we really need the church's support for this event. We, the goal of this event is to uh, continue to reach out into our community and get people um, and, and come in contact with people who normally wouldn't be stepping in foot into our church. And so we need the church's support. This isn't something that just the church staff can put together. It's not something that just the youth group can put together. But in order for us to be able to reach out to the community, we need the support of the entire church. And so we encourage you, uh, if you can sign up to, to set up a trunk, um, it doesn't need to be, you don't need to be like a professional trunk setter upper or anything. You just need to be um, willing to, to, to bring your, your car and just, you know, put some decorations and, um, and, it, and it really touches the kids to be able to, to come by in a safe way um, and we give out candy. If, you, if you're shopping and you see candy on sale, if you can donate candy, we give out, I mean, the amount of candy that we give to the kids that come through is not safe, but we, um, we encourage you to bring candy um, because that is a great way for us to reach out. Um, so if you see candy on sale, um, pick it up and, and we'll have a bin in the lobby for you to donate that. So there's a sign up sheet for the for the trunks and for the candy as well. We also need volunteers. It's a Saturday this year, which is great because that means people aren't coming from work. And so if you can come early to help us set up, we would love it. Uh, if you can stay afterwards just for a little while to, to, um, to set up, to take down, that would be great. If you can help with setting, running games, with, with selling the food. Anyway, if you're interested in helping out and if you can, we ask you because we really want to make this a huge impact to our community. And so please see me or JB for more info. We're also going to have cards. I'm not sure if they're in the lobby yet, but if not, we will have cards that, um, where you can invite someone because it's not just us being there, but we also need to invite. And so we have cards to invite. And then there is a Facebook event now that you can, um, if you weren't invited, if you look up on our, our Redeemer Church Miami page, you'll find the event, Truck Retreat. 
um, and then invite friends via Facebook. It's a great way to invite people that you don't maybe not come in contact with as often. You can invite them to the event on Facebook and they will see all the details and all of that. So that's Trunk Retreat, a big outreach. And then another outreach, a global outreach of our church is Operation Christmas Child. Uh, Christmas is coming faster than we know. And so um, as you're shopping, if you can find things um, that you would like to pack in your shoebox, there's brochures to tell you what you can put. Um, I don't believe there's any shoeboxes left in the lobby, which is a good problem to have. Um, we will work on getting more of them, but you can use any shoebox. It doesn't have to be an Operation Christmas Child one. You can also go to the dollar store and buy the plastic ones. Those are really cool because they, the kids that get them get to reuse the containers. And so um, this is a huge way to bless kids that we will never even get to come in contact with across the country that will never know what Christmas is, that have never gotten a, a Christmas present, but more so they're getting to know about their savior that was born. And, um, and that is the biggest impact that we can have through Operation Christmas Child. So please uh, bring it, uh, start packing your shoe boxes and you can start bringing them in soon. Um, that's Operation Christmas Child. For the men out there, we're having a men's breakfast Saturday, October 17th at 8.30 a.m. in the fellowship hall. Um, if you are interested or want to know more information about that, you can see George Navarro, um, who is here somewhere, I believe, or Michael um, in, the, in the fellowship hall, and, um, or myself and Edwin, if you need more information on that. And then this is for the women. I don't know if you want to see. It's kind of crazy that we're talking about something in 2016 in April, but I want to make this something that every single woman in our church goes to. I believe that if we talk about this early enough that we can, and I'm praying for 50 women, 50 women to go to this conference, not just the women in our church, but also our friends and family. Uh, Beth Moore is, if you've ever done, raise your hand if you've done one of her Bible studies, okay? Beth Moore is awesome. That woman is anointed. I don't know if you've heard her even speak. I know some of the youth have uh, heard her speak at Passion. And she is coming five minutes from our church. Can I get an amen? Okay? <laughs> that is awesome because we don't have traveling costs. We don't have hotels. Um, you don't have to take off of work to go to this event. This is like, in my mind, the best scenario for our church and for our women. So we are asking, um, I need to check and see if there's a, there's a fee. It's technically $59, but it could be $60. Um, and this is the early, early pricing. So we want to jump on board with this. I don't know, but Beth Moore, I mean, she could sell out. So I want to get my ticket ASAP. So please come see me if you're interested. I know Christy's not here today, but she's another person that's connected. And like I said, I want every single woman, if you are possibly able to go, go to this. Do not miss out on this event. Again, it's right there at UM. I mean, right there. We, we can't make it any easier. She can't make it any easier for us. It's an awesome time. Um, Travis Cottrell, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but amazing. Um, he's also a great pianist, a great worship leader, is going to be the worship leader for that event. So it's Friday, April 1st on the evening, and then Saturday morning to lunch. Then we're going to plan on our own, and we'll talk about this in 2016, our own lunch to happen here in the fellowship hall where we can come together as a group and conclude just on our own rather than being a part of the conference. So, again, please stick that in your calendar. Start already thinking about, okay, what am I going to do if I need to get the dad to watch the kids, you know, whatever, dump them on the dads, it's fine. This is a time for you, okay? No, you're not taking leave. Anyway, that's all. And then uh, I think a final announcement is that uh, we like to eat in our church, so light lunch next door after the worship service. So stick around, great time of fellowship um, with each other. So stick around next door after the service. And with that, I will pass it over to Pastor. Thank you, Rika. Hey, let's stand together. Let's join hands across the way. Yeah, I heard one or two stomachs grumbling, so you're hungry. <laughs> we'll go next door. Save Pastor a cookie, please. Just at least one chocolate chip. <laughs> Oh, let's pray together. Oh, Lord, thank you uh, for our church, and thank you for the great things you're doing here. Uh, Lord, thank you that you are praised and you are worshiped, Father, and you have looked down on us with mercy and grace, and you saved us, Lord, from our sin, and you have made us new creations, Father, and we pray for strength and courage to rock the road, to, to walk it with you, Lord. So, Father, we just thank you. Today we praise you, and we just thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives, and we pray that you will continue to do evermore. Uh, may all glory be to the Father. May all praise be to the Son. 
May all hearts open and transparent be to the Holy Spirit. May all blessing, glory, and honor be to the Blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit forevermore. Amen. Let's worship together. Touch the broken 